thank you very, uh, very much, Sherry. Um, glad to see it's only the microphone I have to adjust today. I usually start speeches by saying that if I rule the world, you know, when someone came into the school and said, well, you know, if you were president for today, or if you were Taoiseach for today, or if you ruled the world, what would you do? I usually say I'd make podiums smaller. Uh, uh, because I'm usually sort of doing this behind him, but thankfully, uh, thankfully there's a recognition uh, that, as my father used to say, the best of goods do come in small parcels. And my mother would always whisper as she passed, and so does poison. <laughs> we were taught resilience from a very early age. <laughs> Get over yourself. <laughs> Get over yourself. But thank you so much uh, for the invitation and uh, why I was, I, I jumped up because um, I usually, when I'm listening to speaker, uh, speakers uh, that, uh, that interest me, I usually forget that I'm, I'm the round up speaker and I've often uh, actually been sitting in the audience when someone introduced me and I'd look right and left Jeez, that's me, and, and have to get up and speak. But that, that sometimes happens to me, especially when I'm, um, when I'm listening, as I say, to people that, uh, that intrigue me and, uh, and interest me. And nothing interests me more than mental health. Uh, my sister-in-law says that the reason we're so tolerant in our family is that we know we're so near the edge ourselves. And I think that sort of confirms uh, some of what, uh, what Pat was saying. And it, and it is true. Uh, all of that is true. And I think it is about the, the, the normality of it, the human condition that is the times that we feel uh, emotionally frail and sometimes when we feel very mentally fit. Uh, I think the crossroads that mental health finds uh, itself at is not, I, I would disagree with Marie, is not about um, what road we will take. I think we know the road we will take. We understand the road we will take. The path is very clearly laid out for us where we need to be. I think the crossroads is about language and how we describe it, and how we define ourselves, and how we define what is uh, mental wellness, or emotional wellness, or, or how we describe that in the future, because I think the connotations of the past still come back to haunt us every single day of the week. Um, I can look uh, within five minutes at what used to be Our Lady St. Anne's, uh, on, and the beautifully situated uh, area in Cork City looking down on under, the under Lee uh, which had a thousand people living in it and that did not include the staff. Uh, St Sennans and Wexford equally the same you know and we could all within our own area Sligo we all know exactly uh, where those institutions were and what they meant exactly what they meant. So I do think that the language that we use will have to change because our concept of what we are and how we behave and what impacts on our well-being every day of the week, that has to change, has to change. When I think about stigma in relation to mental health, I always think about cancer. Not that it has any direct connection other than in the area of stigma. And really that stigma, when we used to talk about cancer, and I'm sure that I'm looking at the audience, and I know we're all of an age, except maybe the, the, the maybe one, two, three, right now, I'm going to get the entire second row there, not to, not to discriminate against anyone, probably don't remember it. Uh, but, but could I just say that when we spoke about cancer, uh, we put our hands over our mouths, and we said the other thing, the big C, she doesn't want to talk about it. And the reason we did that when it came to cancer was because we didn't understand it and we knew the outcomes were very bad. But once we did start to understand it, and once we did understand that early intervention and the interventions had very good outcomes, it suddenly, the fear was gone, so therefore the stigma was gone. And now we talk about cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer, pancreatic cancer. We talk about it, you know, as if we were all experts. And we're not all experts. Experts are very few and far between. But what we are, are people that need to know about what our health is. And when it comes to mental health, that is a certainty. We need to know what affects it, how it's affected, uh, and what we can do about it when we're feeling, you know, just that little bit down. And as Pat says, I think we have, have um, because the conversation is now more open, I think we are now sort of, if you like, lumping everything into the one space. And that's not where it should be. 
That's not where it should be. I often quote Barbara Brennan. And Barbara Brennan is a magnificent young woman. Uh, she's vibrant. She's artistic. And uh, when you meet her, you will know you've met her. And the very f two days after I got this job, uh, I was invited by Sea Change to come to one of their public meetings. And Barbara Brennan was the speaker. And she stood up and she said, my name is Barbara Brennan and I'm bipolar. Amazingly. That was exactly the reaction we had. There wasn't a sound. She said, do you not think it's peculiar, she said, that if I stood up and said, my name is Barbara Brennan and I'm chest infection. And it is basically about allowing a condition to define who you are. And that's exactly the point that Pat was making. You know, intervention and treatment is important, is hugely important but at a particular stage, and about listening to people, the people who are truly experts, the people who have difficulty with their mental health, and are the people that should be able to define what that is and what they would like to happen. And that's why the legislation that we are now halfway through, I have to say, uh, cap the capacity legislation, which will replace the Lunatics Act of 1864, 1864, which, by the way, we still operate under, so be careful. <laughs> I'm probably likely to go for it before any of you. But that piece of legislation will replace uh, that arcane piece of legislation. And that piece of legislation, even though it's not perfect, it's not perfect, and I'm sure that someone else in years to come will enhance it and build on it will ensure that we, as we age, and we, as we acquire a disability, and we, as we may find ourselves in the future with a difficulty in relation to our mental health, will have the right, the legal right, if we have the capacity to determine what our treatment will be and to have an input into what that treatment will be. And I know that when people talk about the capacity capacity legislation, because it's, it's quite a complex piece of legislation. They somehow think it's about disabilities, it's about mental health and disability. Well, it's not. It's about each and every one of us. I'm reading a book at the moment. My daughters always say that if my, if you're, if, if my mother ever offers you a book, say no. You know, she reads the most peculiar things, and I do read the most peculiar things. But I'm reading a book at the moment, and the foreword is very interesting. It says, life is a game of chance. Where the five or 50, when you get up in the morning, whether or not you'll get back to that same bed is a roll of the dice. And that's a fact. We are all, every single person you will meet every day of the week, are survivors of survivors. And we have survived plague, pestilence, war, random acts of violence, accidents, all of those things. But not everyone survives into old age. People do acquire brain injuries either through infection, accident, random acts of violence, any of those things. And the capacity legislation will deal with all of that. Will deal with all of that. To allow you in whatever uh, aspect you can, where you have capacity to make decisions for yourself. And as we age, whether it's dementia or any of those other things, or whether it's just your family, as one of my daughters says, be careful, I will be picking your nursing home. So whether it is any of those areas, whether it is any of those areas, we will be protected into the future when we have to make our own decisions. And it won't be those closest to you, even though it may be because you will have that choice as to who to pick. It, will, it may not be those closest to you that will make those decisions for you. So that piece of legislation will have a significant impact. And the one piece I couldn't understand when I asked with the group together in terms of the review of the Mental Health Act, and Pat would be very conscious of this, the one piece I couldn't get my head around was the voluntary and involuntary. And myself and Sherry have had this conversation uh, numerous times. But they came up with an ingenious approach. If you decide to go to an acute unit because you're having a difficulty with your mental health and you're admitted... And after about three days, you decide, well, you know, I'm kind of feeling okay now. I think I'll go home. And suddenly, 
someone like Pat says, well, actually, no. Uh, I don't think you're capable of going home. Then the suggestion they've come up with is that at that point, you now will have to be treated as if it was the first time you stepped through that door. And your mental health would have to be assessed, but your capacity will be assessed as well. And probably at that point, we're agreed, Pat, that your capacity would probably be non-existence if you're in an acute phase. But your capacity will have to continue to be assessed, which it wasn't in the past. And as soon as your capacity returns, you then have the right to have a say in what your treatment will be. Now, that is significant, is significant, and will have an, an impact on a huge amount of people. So all of that type of change in legislation is happening. But you can have all the legislation, and we were talking earlier on this morning, by the way, about a sepsis protocol, for very good reasons, as um, Joe rightly points it out, the last time I was about to uh, speak here, um, yes, it was an attack of sepsis, and yes, I was very grateful I was in Letterkenny Hospital at the time. Uh, where would you prefer to get an attack other than inside in a hospital, especially when you had the type of experts that were there? So I, 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 I was very lucky to be there. But we now have a sepsis protocol in each hospital, and someone that I was speaking to about it recently said, that's great, they look good on the wall, uh, you know, how do you implement them? And really, legislation and implementation is what it's all about. It really is what it's all about. And we have to make sure that those we are training in the future and those who will buy into the process of that type of implementation in relation to uh, legislation and the rights, the fundamental and human rights of people, even if they don't have capacity and if they have a difficulty with their mental health at that time, is going to be hugely important. And I was listening to Mary, and, you know, it's, it's only when for the last, I suppose, three years we have been getting ring fence money and putting it in and putting it in and putting it in to build up what was a service that had been neglected for a long number of years, for a long number of years. And when we got to the point where this year I had to make up my mind about that 35 million again, and every year it is, what are we going to do with it? Where are the gaps? How will we manage it? What do we need? we got to the waiting list for child and adolescent services of 3,000. And I said to myself, why do we consistently have a waiting list of 3,000? You know, it's never 2,700. It's never 3,200. You know, it's none of those things. Why do we consistently have that number? And we started to look at it. And we started to look behind the headline that Mary outlines. We started to look behind that headline. And it's important that we look behind headlines, you know, because, uh, you know, we have a saying in our family that says, yeah, it's a good story, all headlines, no news. And the headline usually does not reflect the story. And what we discovered about that 3,000 is that, yes, there are uh, children waiting more than a year for a service. And you would say to yourself that, you know, if a child needed that service and needed it urgently, they couldn't possibly wait a year. Does that make sense to anyone? How could you possibly wait a year? If you, if you were in that need, how could you wait a year? And what we started to discover was that there are children within the education system, and the education system, by the way, has its own psychological service, who are now being referred to CAMS, the Child and Adolescent Service, for a diagnosis. By the way, now it's the psychological service within education is referring them to the other psychiatric service. For a diagnosis to come back to them to tell them what services the child needs in the classroom. Now, I don't know. Am I the only person that thinks that that is the roundabout that Pat thinks we're all on? But I think it is. So we are now taking a very clear look at that 3,000. And we discovered that almost 300 of them should never have been there in the first place. They should actually have been in primary care and dealt with there. So they're going off there. So it brings me back to the point of the psychologist who changed services. This is the truth now. Who changed services. And after three days in the new service, put someone on a waiting list. The manager of the service went up and said, 
We don't have waiting lists, sir. You can't do that. Really, she said. So how do you get resources? I think that tells you something. So basically where we're at with mental health is taking an in-depth look at what we're getting for the money. And there are still very few, very few, very few, but powerful, small rump who every time I meet them tell me we're all in favour of vision for change. And the minute they say that to you, you know there's a problem. <laughs> right? But, you know, I'm not a racist. But, the minute they say that, there's a problem. Who do they report to? What sanctions are there? And how do we ensure that they do the job that they're paid very well to do? And constantly pointing out the problem is not a solution. Is not a solution. And I have had four years now of going into battle every single year, looking for money for mental health and being successful, by the way. I think most people would agree with that. Being successful at a time of huge recession. We were the only people in the health services that had enough money to recruit. But we couldn't because I think we damaged the brand so much that people didn't want to work for us. And I can understand that. But it's beginning to change. Beginning to change. Only slightly, but beginning to change. But now we've got to start looking at value for money. Value for money. Where are we getting that value? And people who don't want to work there are people who feel that they're not answerable to anyone. Really, we have to challenge that. We have to challenge that. We wouldn't put it up with it in any other area. But our difficulty is that people who do have a serious issue in relation to mental health find it very difficult to articulate their complaints. They find it very difficult. And, you know, there are times when I get frustrated and I say to myself, why aren't people within, within the treatment service coming out and supporting what we're doing? Until I suddenly realise, how can they? It's an unequal relationship. They find it difficult to articulate it. And they find it difficult because they're worried that the person that they're now out to speak about is going to be sitting there in front of them next week. So it's how do you manage to get around that? Because we could spend an awful lot of energy in fighting these battles. And to be honest and straight about it, I think I have too much maturity to do that now. So it is about putting different services in that are available to people, like SIPSI, for instance, like the primary care counselling service, like the jigsaws of this world, like uh, service level agreements in relation to my mind and other different organisations, and about getting around all of that. The first plan, as Pat rightly points out, in relation to the decongregation of those big institutions, uh, was published in 1964. Not even much happened, but at least it started a conversation. And I think conversation is hugely important. The second plan, I'm always very proud to say, uh, was published by Barry Desmond in 1984, coming into operation in 1985. And the morning I got the phone call from the Tarnished's office to say that, would you be interested in mental health? I actually still have Barry Desmond's planning for the future in my, in my room. I know, as my, as my, coming back to my daughters, if my mother ever offers you a book, don't take it. And I still have that on a bookshelf. And the next plan was 2006, and that is Vision for Change, which sets out in a far more detailed way what we need to do in relation to how we manage the nation's needs in relation to mental health. If you notice that there is 20 years between each one of those. Vision for Change will reach its natural life, the end of its natural life next year. I've already set about putting a group in place to look at what's beyond vision. And we need to do that. Even though we haven't fulfilled entirely what's in vision, I'm not certain that we should either. But what we should never do is allow that type of gap to happen again. Dermot Walsh, who was the original inspector of, of mental health, came in to see me. And he's an incredible man as Pat and anyone here on the panel that no one will tell you. He's an incredible man. 
And he came in to me and he said, I heard, and I won't mention the place because it's still a little bit sore. He said, I heard you're thinking of closing. I said, I am. And he said, right. He said, I recommended that that unit would close, he said, in 1972. <laughs> yeah, mental health moves slowly. I said, really? He said, yeah. And he said, your predecessor, he said, Barry Desmond. I said, yeah. He said, he went down to close it. I said, right, right. And he said, they beat him with placards. I said, really? He said, yeah. So he said, I'm watching you now. <laughs> I'm watching you now. I said, okay, that's okay. Yeah, it's okay. He said, let's see. So anyway, the word went out. We're closing the unit. And as usual, of course, there was the, the usual uh, radio programs. And, uh, you know, we'd love the minister to come and visit. I said, I'd love to. Send me the invitation. So they did. Sent me the invitation. And they sent me the invitation the following day, um, the following week, I got a letter in the post from an anonymous uh, person uh, with a leaflet in it that was being given out in the unit to everyone that visited, uh, saying, the minister has agreed to come and visit. We will give you plenty of notice. Please be outside the gate to let her know how you feel. So I arrived on Monday morning at nine o'clock and didn't bother telling them. <laughs> and the unit is closed. So I think Dermot Walsh was uh, significantly surprised, was significantly surprised. He also told me, of course, that the medication which is now costing us far more now was exactly the same medication as he was prescribing in the late 60s, early 70s. And I think that's the big piece in relation to what's beyond vision. But if you think that was interesting, I'll tell you a better one. And this is the one that really gets to me, really gets to me. You've gathered by now I'm no expert on mental health. I just know how to get money and how to develop legislation and give instructions. That's all I know. About once or twice a year I bring together all the psychiatrists who are in charge of the entire country. There are about 10 of them, Pat, about 10. And they come in and they sit down and we have a chat about what's happening and where the gaps are and you know, what they think should happen next and where there are difficulties and where there are huge problems. Our last meeting, one of them did all the talking, Justin Brophy, he's a great guy. And when we were, when Justin stopped, I looked down at a guy that I would have huge respect for down the end of the table. And I said, Noel, I said, you're a typical psychiatrist. I said, you haven't opened your mouth all day. You see, I think psychiatrists get money for Jen. That's a joke now, Pat, I'm not saying. <laughs> that really is a joke. <laughs> I'm in enough trouble with psychiatrists. I really think that's a joke. Yeah. But um, he says, um, yeah, he said, if you, were to, if you were to ask me, he said, what really upsets me? He said, what really upsets me, he said, is the doctor that rings at five o'clock on a Friday evening with a child that's very distressed and I can't get a bed for them and I know that their poor misfortunate parents are going to have to deal with that distressed child for the whole weekend. Now I don't think there is anyone in the world that wouldn't, you know, that that wouldn't go to their hearts. And I said, that's a problem, all right. And the guy sitting next to him said, yeah, what really upsets me is the virtual patients. And I just went around the table, pretended nothing. And that, that Friday afternoon, I sat in the car, it was about seven o'clock in the evening, and I sat in the car, I just finished doing something, and I said to the guy that drives for me, Jack, I said, Jack, do you know where so and such a place is? I do, he said. I said, right. I said, drive me down there. So we drove down, and we knocked at the door, and a very surprised nurse came out, and I said, are you in charge? And she said, no. I said, well, then will you get me someone that's in charge? So she did, a very polite young woman. So he came out, and uh, we had a chat, and I said, um, he said, would you like a cup of tea? I said, I'd love one. I really would love one. So we went in, and uh, we had a cup of tea. Uh, I ended up making it, uh, and uh, <laughs> I have no problems about being a woman. Come on. <laughs> so I, I did that, and um, with that, I said, uh, how, ma how many people have you in? How many children have you in? They're usually not really small children, 
they're usually sort of mid to late teens, usually. And uh, 11. Oh, I said, that's okay. And how many staff? So I told me that. And I said, that's okay. Yeah, that's okay. So we had another cup of tea. And I said, uh, you do know now, I said, I'm going to want to meet each one of them individually. And he pulled out a list and told me he had six. So when I hear statistics, I now say to myself, is it true? Is it not true? I carried out the same exercise that week in another unit and discovered the same thing. So, you know, as Pat was saying, it is about what impacts on us? How do we deal with it? And if we're not all in this together, and I'm not just talking about you and me now, I am talking about the people that we pay to carry out this job. If we're not all in this together, then it's going to be a continuous row. There's going to be mistrust built up and we really need to ensure that when we say that a service is going to be delivered, that that service will be delivered. Because it's unacceptable that when people are in distress and when people do need help, that if I say I've set aside five million for that project and that project is not being delivered, then really it's unacceptable for me as a politician because the first thing I'll be accused of is telling lies. But most, more than anything else, it's unacceptable for those who need a service. I think we have made enormous strides in this country when it comes to mental health. And coming back to Sherry's first remark, she is dead right. The fact that we are speaking about mental health so openly and in every context means that we have made progress. And it is about the conversation, about speaking out loud, and about recognising that there are people who have severe mental health problems and that we need to treat in a different way. That sort of compartmentalising what the issues are. We will be getting a new central mental hospital. They just received planning permission and it's gone out to Portran. And included in that will be a unit that will deal with people who have an intellectual disability, which we didn't have before. And also, there will be an additional unit for children who have the type of severe difficulties that only people in the forensic service can deal with. And that's the type of planning we need for the future, going back to Barry Desmond's uh, uh, booklet. That's the type of planning we need for the future. But coming back to the psychiatrist that I met in Donegal when I opened, and I know there's a few people here that were there on that day, I'm always the last to speak, and I don't know why, but the psychiatrist that spoke before me stood up and finished off his, uh, his speech by saying, but we're not there yet. And we're not. And I'm not certain we ever need to be wherever there is. And I just hope that in the journey we're on, when we reach that crossroads, that we will be open to the type of change and different routes that we may need to take. Because sometimes defining what the journey's end is can limit you. And we shouldn't do that when we're dealing with emotional well-being. I think we need to change the language. I think that's the crossroads we're at. We need to start talking about mental fitness. That's what people buy into. That wellness piece, that mental fitness. And we all have days when we're emotionally fragile. We all have them. And we need to recognise that as well. I just launched a project in Cork and it's called Infant Mental Health. And it's about the entire family. And it's about training people to respond to the needs of very young children. Very young children. My grandson, at six, taught me a lesson I will never forget. I must have had an off day because I'm not normally like this. And I said something very sharp to him. I must have been in a hurry or something, you know, ball binder. 
And he turned around and he says to me, Nana, you've really hurt my heart. (laughs) Ah, come on. (laughs) 50 euros and two trips to Smith's. And he can still pull it out of the bag, you know. And they think, you know, and they think it's only women that have the sort of the ability to impose guilt. No, it's not. No, it's not. Children do it very well. But it taught me something. And what it really taught me is that children are as sensitive as any adult you will meet. And they can feel hurt and humiliation. And they sometimes feel that humiliation on behalf of others, like their mother or their brothers or their sisters, and not necessarily on behalf of themselves. So it is about the whole being, and it is about from the time we're born. We don't learn disappointment, we are taught it. We don't learn emotion, we are it. So I hope that when we think about mental health, that we think about it not just in the context of services, but in how we react on what we are. Thank you.